tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. And become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Fume. Cold turkey may be great on sandwiches, but there's a better way to break your bad habits. And no, we're not talking about weird mind voodoo from your crazy neighbor or making any deals with the devil. We're talking about our sponsor, Fume, and they look at the problem in a different way. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Keep your mouth busy and your conscience clean. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code HORROR to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com and use code HORROR to save an additional 10% off your order today. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Specifically, tonight's episode includes mentions of suicide and sexual violence against minors. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening, listeners. I'm Eric Peabody, and welcome back to Horror Hill. This is our final episode before Halloween this year, and what better way to celebrate than with a double feature of scary stories? That's right, listeners, we've got two tales for you this evening, both of them written by returning author William Stewart, and, instead of giving a story-by-story preview like usual... I'm going to let the titles speak for themselves. Tonight, my dear friends, we'll be reading A Ghost is Trying to Kill Me and Samhain. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you wouldn't happen to still have all of your organs, would you? And now... 
From author William Stewart, I give you, A Ghost is Trying to Kill Me. A couple of weeks ago, I sat on a discussion panel with a team of paranormal investigators at a local Halloween convention. I don't know how or why, but I think my being around them caught the attention of something, and I think it's trying to hurt or even kill me. The discussion was nothing crazy, no Ouija boards or seances or anything. A husband and wife had lived in an old house in Georgia somewhere and had experienced phenomena that could only be described as paranormal. The pair had moved from that house and discovered that wherever they went afterward, they would notice similar things, as if their exposure to this strange energy gave them an insight or extra sense to the things beyond the veil. Their stories were interesting and spooky, and above all else, they were genuine. I know there are many out there who do not believe in life after death, spirits, or extrasensory perceptions, but these people did. Their stories were true, at least to them, and in the telling, there was no guile. Everything they said, they believed. I was merely a moderator in this discussion. It was my job to ask questions, round us back to center if the conversation went too far off topic, and watch the time. It was not in my purview to judge or pose skepticism. This was an event to celebrate the strange and unusual, after all, and this discussion fit right in. The panel went well, and everyone had a good time. I'd been meaning to reach out to the couple again to have them on my podcast. Their stories were engaging and interesting, the perfect subject matter for the spooky season. But it's also a very busy time for me and my family, so I've been putting it off so that I can get the house ready for the epic Halloween party we throw every year. Tuesday night was like any other. I sat in my office and read a bit before writing down a couple story ideas and making some notes. I was usually tired from the day, so I decided to watch some YouTube videos and play online rather than try to focus on anything too serious. I kicked around for an hour or so and then finally gave up and turned in at about 10.30. The next morning, I was strangely cold. Although we did keep the thermostat lower at night than some, I was absolutely freezing and couldn't figure out why. I looked at the clock and it was only about 30 minutes before I normally got up, so I rolled out of bed and got busy starting the day. I made lunches for the kids and gathered my stuff for work then dropped them off at school and headed into the office. My wife, Tina, had asked that I pick up a couple of things at the store that morning, and since none of them were perishable and I was in no hurry, I stopped into a Kroger to get the errand done. It was early and the store wasn't fully open yet. A few aisles still had dimmed lights and a tired-eyed employee was running a floor buffer. I skipped past him and set about gathering my items kids' allergy medicine, toothpaste, bread, and a present for my daughter's friend's birthday party this weekend. I grabbed the bread and headed to the other side of the store to get the medicine and toothpaste. I turned into the aisle and started looking for my brand of toothpaste when I felt a presence. I looked up to see a man staring at me. He was old, mid-seventies if I had to guess, and stocky. He stood a few feet away from me and scowled. I wasn't sure what to make of this. I had no cart and wasn't in his way as far as I could tell. Still, I stepped to the side and nodded towards him, giving him the right away. He didn't move, just stood there, looking angry. He had close-cropped white hair, light blue eyes, and a mole or a wart on his cheek. He was dressed in a white t-shirt and brown pants. He didn't look strange or homeless or anything, just angry. And whatever he was angry about, he seemed to think that I was a part of it. Perplexed, I motioned for him to pass, and when he didn't, I started to back away in the other direction. We'd just brush our teeth with mouthwash tonight. Screw this weirdness. In a flash, he was on me. One hand gripped my right arm and lifted it while the other drove a thumb into my ribs and pushed hard. 
I staggered sideways into the shelving and tried to push him off of me. My ribs stung from where he jabbed them, and his grip on my arm was strong and firm. I felt myself going off balance, and at the same time felt the man lean into the fall, as if to use our momentum to drop and pin me. He growled a bit as I fell, letting me know he intended to continue this assault after we'd landed. My feet went out from under me, and we went down. I sat up in bed, completely disoriented, scared, and panicked. What had just happened? The change of scenery so suddenly was almost as bad as the attack, but what the hell had just happened? How did... Where was I? What the hell? I rolled out of bed and shoved my glasses onto my face. I could tell Tina was there because I could hear her sleepy breathing. The clock said 1.14 a.m. Had the attack happened this morning? Why couldn't I remember? Had I been stabbed? Shouldn't I be in the hospital or something? I went to the bathroom and checked out my side and chest in the mirror. No marks to indicate having been hit. There was no pain, but there should have been. He hit me hard. I made my way to the kitchen and drank a glass of water, trying to calm my heart, which was in complete overdrive. All I could guess was that I'd been assaulted and that maybe I'd blacked out or something. I've been under sedation before, so once I got control of myself, I could start thinking rationally about what could have happened that I simply missed for whatever reason. I sat on the sofa in my living room and scrolled on my phone for a moment before I noticed something. I'd seen all of these posts, and recently. I moved through another dozen or more before it struck me. I closed the app and looked at the date. It was still only Tuesday night, or at least it was very early Wednesday morning. I hadn't woken up early on Wednesday to get my kids ready and stop at the store on my way into work. I had not encountered an angry old man in the toothpaste aisle and lost a bunch of memories. Had it all been a dream? The relief I felt when I realized what had happened was immense. Just a dream. <laughs> nothing to worry about. But it had been so real, and so realistic. I had most certainly gotten up and made the kids lunch. I had. My kids had been excited about having the new jelly on their toast, and I'd had to send the younger one to get her mom to help with her hair, because it was too tangled for me to deal with and make breakfast at the same time. Then the older one needed help with finishing her homework. This was too real. What dream that ends with a strange old guy beating you up for no reason begins with toast, jam, and doing actual math problems on an iPad? I've had a lot of weird dreams, but nothing even close to this one. A while later, after all rational thought had returned, and so did the realization that in the morning I would have to get up and actually make breakfast for my kids rather than just imagining it, I decided to go back to bed. I plugged my phone back in, turned off the lights, and lay back down. I did not pull the covers over me because, bizarre dreams or not, I'm a hot sleeper and can't get comfortable under the covers. I just lay there and dozed, ironically hoping that the monsters under the bed weren't hungry for grown-up feet. I can only assume I dozed quickly, because the next thing I knew, it was nearly three. I woke up shivering and terribly cold. I felt around for the blanket and pulled it over me, but then immediately began to sweat from being too hot. I decided I needed to go and check the thermostat and make sure one of the kids hadn't set it to Arctic by mistake. I went down the hall and checked, but there was nothing wrong. In fact, it was a couple degrees warmer than we usually kept it. I made my way back to bed. Tina moved fitfully, clearly unhappy with my nocturnal adventures, and I rolled in next to her and tried to get comfortable again. Hot. Too hot sweating. Half asleep, I kicked my feet out from under the covers and lay there, just trying to cool off and get this strange night behind me. 
It was almost four now, and I was mostly awake, being frustrated, too cold, too hot, or too something to sleep. I rolled over, away from Tina and toward the wall, and looked right into the face of the old man from the grocery store. His scowl was more of a smile now, and his eyes bore into me. He knelt beside the bed and considered me for a moment. I couldn't move. I could barely even breathe, my voice trapped somewhere deep inside me. My fear seemed to amuse the man. He stared at me and seemed almost about to laugh. Then he narrowed his eyes and drove one of his hands into my side. I writhed in pain. Where before he had hit me with a fist and a thumb, this time he had some sort of weapon and was twisting it between two of my ribs. I flailed out with my left hand and grabbed at his face, trying to get an eye or something, anything to get him to release his grip, to make him let me go. I finally managed to move just enough, kicking my legs out and slipping out of his hands. I slid off the end of the bed and stood up, my arms raised in a pitiful karate stance I learned when I was ten. The man stood there and laughed silently. Then he disappeared. My tussle with the phantom had barely registered with my sleeping wife. After my attacker had vanished, she rolled over and cozied up into the covers. She seemed cold, but otherwise unaware of our visitor. I, of course, was too shaken to sleep again that night. After a few minutes of nervous pacing, trying to decide whether what had happened had been real or a dream, I lay down beside my wife and stared at the ceiling, trying to warm up my cold feet and slow my racing heart. I was on edge the next day, tired and paranoid. I trudged through my morning, just going through the motions of getting the kids ready for school and myself ready for work. Everything startled me, made me pause. We have a stained glass window that distorts the light from the street when cars go by, and as the neighbors piled out of their garages for their morning commutes, every passing headlight hit that glass, and every reflection made my heart lurch. I dropped the kids off at school, but instead of heading into the office, I went back home. I sat on the sofa in the empty house and thought about calling in sick or at least logging in from home. I didn't know what was happening, but something told me my violent new companion might be waiting for me somewhere out there. I tried to rationalize it away. After all, he had just attacked me in my own bedroom, so it's not like I was any safer here than anywhere else. But the idea of trying to contact and negotiate with customers in my condition just left me feeling deflated. I sat on the sofa staring at the wall for a long time before I finally decided that calling in was for the best. The day passed without incident, and so did the next and the one after that. I went back to work and was happy to not be accosted next to the copier or snack machine. After about a week, I had all but forgotten about my angry phantom. Chalk it up to stress, fatigue, or indigestion, I don't know, but things went back to normal after a few days. It was a full two weeks later that it happened. I was in Kroger picking up some odds and ends on the way home from work. I was weighing onions when I saw him on the other side of the produce section. A shot of adrenaline, and I began to slowly back away. He hadn't seen me, or at least wasn't looking my way. I dropped the onions into the cart, turned it the other direction, and booked it away from him as fast as I could. I was speed walking, almost running toward the exit, when I felt a hand on my shoulder. I released the cart and spun away from the man, just as he swung his fist around, barely missing my stomach. My shoes squeaked on the waxed floor as I twisted, and I could see the knife in his hand as it came within inches of my abdomen. I fell backward and he overcorrected, 
slamming into a gondola and knocking it over, merchandise crashing all around. I regained my footing in time to avoid another slash, and then I was moving away from him as fast as I could, scrambling for a weapon, anything I could use against this manic assault. I grabbed a bottle of vinegar and heaved it at him, but it went wide and crashed somewhere behind him without effect. He stood and smiled at me, icy blue eyes twinkling with glee. Although I had no idea what was going on, this guy was clearly having a good time. I took a step backward and he took one forwards, the knife gleaming in his hand. I grabbed another bottle of something and threw it, and again it didn't land. What was happening? I took another step backward and then he broke into a sprint, closing the gap between us in seconds. I tried to turn and run, but he was too fast. The crazy old man crashed into me and we both tumbled to the ground as his weapon found purchase, digging deep under my ribs before he laughed and twisted it deeper. I screamed as his cold eyes bore into mine, and he smiled, his mission apparently accomplished. And then I woke up with tubes in my nose and an IV in my arm. Of course, I'd been assaulted, stabbed. The guy, the ghost, had stabbed me. As I struggled to come awake, the vague, faraway feeling of pain in my side let me know I was right. I glanced around and found a call button. I was thirsty. A few minutes later, a nurse came in and brought me some ice chips and offered me some juice. She took her readings and made her notes, and then said that the doctor would be in to see me shortly. A couple minutes after that, Tina came in, her eyes puffy from crying and lack of sleep. She sobbed as she leaned in for a hug, not too tightly, and then wiped her eyes and nose on a tissue. She pulled a chair over and sat holding my hand until the doctor came in. Well, Mr. Baker, that was a close one, but we have you all back together now. How are you feeling? I began to try to speak, but the tubes got in the way, so I gave a weak thumbs up. The doctor said a few things to Tina as she stood up and hugged him before wiping her eyes again. Did... did you catch him? I asked, despite the tubes. The doctor and Tina both looked at me. The doctor raised an eyebrow and a glance was passed between them. Who, honey? Tina asked. The... the man who did this to me. Who stabbed me? Did they catch him? The doctor smiled and said to Tina, That's just the anesthesia wearing off. He should be fine in a bit. I looked at my wife, waiting for an answer. I was weak and in pain but almost desperate to find out what was going on. Honey, nobody stabbed you. Your appendix ruptured. You were in the grocery store yesterday when you started screaming and collapsed. They brought you here and did emergency surgery to take it out. I imagine it did feel a bit like getting stabbed, the doctor added. I've seen a lot of burst appendixes in my time, but yours was pretty bad. But you'll be okay now. He made a few notes and then left the room. The nurse pushed some pain medicine through the IV and she left too. Tina and I stared at one another for a while before she got up. I have to go pick up the kids. I'll drop them off with your mom and be back up here in a couple of hours. I love you. I love you too, I mouthed to her as she moved towards the door. I watched as she swung the big, weighted door open and passed through. The medicine caused my vision to fade as I caught a glimpse of the nurse's station right across the hall, and in the nurse's station stood a man, seventy-ish, with close-cropped white hair, ice-blue eyes, and a mole on his right cheek. As the door swung shut, and my vision blurred. He held up a knife, a much bigger one this time, and grinned.
This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Fume. If you're just joining us, we're talking about our sponsor, Fume, and they look at things in a different way. Instead of completely erasing your undesirable habits, why not just remove the bad elements from them? Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air, and instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses delicious flavors, meaning no overwhelming or harsh smells left behind on your fingers and clothes. One of the things I really like is that Fume mouthpieces come with an adjustable airflow dial and are designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting. This provides your fingers opportunity for a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and taking the edge off of anxiety while breaking your habit. Let's leave out the aspect of bad habits for a quick moment. Fume is fun, chemical-free flavored air. I wasn't sure what to expect at first, but found myself pleasantly surprised by the flavors. Whether you crave a fresh mint flavor, raspberry lemonade, or even white cranberry, which is my favorite for the season, Fume has you covered. Fresh, delicious air at your fingertips with no harm done to your lungs and no harsh smells left behind on your hands, breath, and clothing. Also, Fume is made naturally. There's no electricity needed, and no charger to keep track of or outlets to fight over is always a good thing. The shape and quality of the real wood piece is super sleek, fancy-looking, and light. And because it's flavored vaporized air and not harmful or altering chemicals, you can enjoy your fume with you on the go. Not all habits have to be bad for you. Let's create better ones together. You get what I mean. Instead of bad, fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easy. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Keep your mouth busy and your conscience clean. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code HORROR to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com and use code HORROR to save an additional 10% off your order today. You've been listening to A Ghost is Trying to Kill Me by William Stewart. And now, listeners, to close out the Halloween season, I present Samhain by William Stewart. The whole thing started as a curiosity piece, part of a week-long Halloween-themed series it's the sort of maudlin fluff that serious journalists despise, but what we all end up doing so much more of than actual reporting. This is the stuff of small town newspaper. Talk with an old lady whose cat was rescued by the fire department. Cover the ribbon cutting at the new Chevron station. Interview old folks and ask them what it was like to grow old in this no-horse town in the middle of nowhere. But I digress. It was nearing Halloween, and the boss wanted to report on some dark and mysterious things in our town's history. I was handed three assignments. The first was the fire that destroyed the old courthouse way back in 1928. This was a huge deal back then, as all the court records went up in smoke one night. To this day, the cause of the fire remains unknown. I had the pleasure of meeting the town's oldest resident, Mrs. Kimmy Duguid, who is 97 years young this fall. She was seven years old at the time and claims to have been there to watch it burn. This was difficult to coalesce with the fact that archived accounts report that the fire started sometime in the middle of the night and that by the time anyone even knew there was a problem, the building had already been reduced to cinders and ash. Miss Kimmy was a sweetheart, though, so I didn't really care whether or not she was lying. The second assignment was an interview with Lawrence Thomas Griffith III to discuss the 44th year of the charity ball and auction at the KC Hall. 
Griffith III is the owner of Griffith Motors, established 1948, our local car dealership. His grandfather, Griffith Sr., had come back from the war with a piece of shrapnel and a dream, and had run a very successful dealership until his retirement in the mid-70s. His son, Griffith Jr., was a showman. He often appeared on radio and television to promote the dealership and anything else he had going on, which largely consisted of charity fundraisers. He was a beloved figure in town who greatly improved his father's legacy and made a significant impact on the town's economy. The charity ball and auction are local traditions that people look forward to all year. Griffith III is a young, sad-faced, and serious man with little of his father's charisma or personality. While not unpleasant to be around, it is obvious that the young man's heart is not in selling cars. If I had to guess, I think he'd prefer the big city and all its flavor to the small town we inhabit, if you know what I mean. And Griffith III is an only child, so the entire family business rests on his shoulders. I personally don't see the dealership making it another five years. And that's the kind of life we lead. Small town, big gossip, old school. In spite of the internet, we still sell out our entire print run every week. We sometimes even have to print late editions. Kids still play in front yards here. The ladies gather at the salon and talk about whose teenagers are messing around with whose. And the Baptist Church's Spring Festival is the most anticipated event of the year. These are good, solid, salt-of-the-earth folks. It's the kind of place just about anyone, well anyone except Griffith III, would like to put down roots and live easy. Unless you were living here between 1998 and 2001. Then, it was most definitely not one of those places. In those years, the town was terrorized by a serial killer. Four total victims, all under the age of ten, snatched from their own bedrooms on Halloween night. There were never any signs of a break-in or struggle, and none of the victims were ever found. Making the situation even stranger was how the story ended. In 01, shortly after the fourth victim went missing, a local man by the name of Charles Lee Brooks walked into the police station and confessed to snatching, raping, and killing the children. He said he would cooperate fully and show where he'd hidden the bodies. He declined counsel and said he didn't even want a defense. He swore that he was guilty and needed to be punished. He also begged to be locked up. Unfortunately, the bodies were never recovered, nor were the confessions ever made. You see, once they had him all locked up, Mr. Brooks took a sheet and wrapped it around his neck and hanged himself from the bars. It should have been national news, but there was always a bigger, juicier story somewhere else. Even when the story took such an unusual turn, there was still wall-to-wall -wall coverage of 9-11 on almost every channel, so the story was never picked up by the media. Locally, however, it was quite the sensation. Charles Brooks was a chronically unemployed alcoholic who lived on the outskirts of town. He did odd jobs and errands to make ends meet, and when he was in a rare dry spell, he made his money working on people's cars. Despite all his problems, Brooks was magical when it came to motors. He could rebuild an engine by himself in an afternoon. The police concluded later that's why there were never any signs of a break-in. Brooks had simply copied his customer's house keys and let himself in. My third assignment for Halloween was to interview the officers who worked the case of the Sowen Killer all those years ago. My boss, the Ledger's editor-in-chief, S.L. Cypress, was the man who named the killer. He wasn't subtle about wanting to get famous, to contribute to national publications, go on TV, and all that, so he took extra steps to sensationalize the whole thing. The insensitive bastard even added jack-o'-lanterns and black cats to columns discussing the murders, even years after Brooks had died. 
To say that the people of this town are not fans of Halloween would be an understatement. The thing was, nobody ever came calling. National media didn't care about a year's solved case that never produced any details. It was simply a tragic tale in an otherwise uninteresting small town somewhere in America. Yet, every five or ten years, Cyprus would drop the assignment on one of his staff writers, making them pull out the files and relive all the boring details. Team? He'd say, rubbing his hands together excitedly and smiling broadly. It's been long enough. America needs to know about Sam Hain. He said it incorrectly. He said it incorrectly every time. For a man of words, this was like nails on a chalkboard. It was the sort of mistake that would see the red of a proofer's pen so quickly if it was written, but since it was spoken, our otherwise super strict boss man simply refused to correct it. He'd say it on the radio, too, whenever he was invited on to discuss local events or history. It's just a travesty that such a tragic event was just ignored. It's like nobody cared at all about the suffering of the people of a small town. People need to know what happened here. People need to know about Sam Hain. Now, to be fair, the story of Samhain did have plenty of mystery and intrigue, and his crimes certainly should have blown up alongside killers like Bundy and the Zodiac. Four victims, killed by a familiar local personality, and no bodies. It wasn't that it was boring in and of itself. It was that after writing the same damn article so many times over the years, nobody wanted to do it yet again. So, Cypress assigned Garden Club and Marching Band and Newlyweds with Ironic Names and damn near every other kind of fluff that we just despise, and damn it if I didn't get stuck behind a train on the way to work that morning. So I got to the office with exactly one assignment left to choose up on the board. Samhain. Damn. SL wanted the angle of the story to be a 20th anniversary of the disappearance of the first victim, Kyle Walters. He wanted interviews with police and family members. The problem with that was that most of the people who were involved with Samhain just really didn't want to relive that time of their lives. Twenty years is a long time, but when you lose a child, those scars never heal. They never go away. S.L. didn't care. He wanted his story, and he would have it. On his desk, Friday morning, or there would be hell to pay. Fair enough, I'd write his damn story. I went to my desk and prepared to do a very simple Control-C and Control-V on the article I'd written last time. I sat down and booted up my computer and dicked around on my phone while I waited for the desktop to come up. Checking Facebook, I discovered that Arnold Waller had died. Sheriff Waller had been the face of law enforcement my entire life. In his brown uniform, hat, and boots, Waller was as much a symbol of this town as the Water Tower or the Little League Park. I went to school with his son. Frankie was one grade above me, but the school was so small that most everyone, except for the very oldest and the very youngest, were friends. I posted a quick thoughts and prayers comment and stared at my computer screen. Sheriff Waller had been there that night that Brooks had come into the station, was likely the one who called in the M.E. when Brooks kicked it, too. I picked up my phone again and reread the post. My father, Sheriff Arnold Waller, died this morning at home. He was 79. Funeral announcements forthcoming. Thank you for your concern and support. F. It wasn't much almost strikingly stark. And Frankie wasn't a guy known for brevity. Frankie liked to talk. I read and reread his post. Comments with broken heart and sad face emojis started rolling in. The whole town was going to be in mourning. Sheriff Waller was an institution. He'd been patrolling for most of everyone's lives. When he retired, he'd been with the department for 36 years. And Frankie adored his father. 
The two of them were practically inseparable, always hunting, fishing, going to games. Something didn't add up. Even though it was just Facebook, Frankie Waller was not one to elegize his father with a mere 23 words. I grabbed my keys and went straight to his house. Frankie's vintage Ford Galaxy was in the driveway and the garage was open when I arrived, but nobody answered the door. I called around and poked at the edges, deciding whether I wanted to risk just walking in. I was standing in the garage pondering the issue when Frankie opened the door and we startled each other. Jesus Christ, John, you scared the hell out of me. Frankie, I'm sorry. I rang the bell, but no one answered. I, uh, I saw your Facebook. I came by to see how you were holding up. He didn't look good. His normally jovial demeanor was gone. His dark hair was messy, and he had about three days of beard. His skin was greasy, and he looked as if he hadn't showered in days. He narrowed his eyes at me and then looked at the ground. I... uh, I'm not feeling much like company, John. Been a hard road to hoe the last few days. He went to the refrigerator and got a beer, then cracked the tab and drank half of it in a single swallow. In all my life, I don't think I remember ever seeing Frankie even drink a beer, what with his dad being the sheriff and all. The Wallers were pretty straight-laced. When we were young, Frankie only avoided earning the nickname Opie by being big enough to smash anyone who dared say it out loud. I'm not proud of the fact that we called him that behind his back anyway, and sometimes still do. But, mean or not, it was accurate. Now, this impossibly and sometimes irritatingly upstanding man was drunk at nine in the morning. True, he was mourning his father, but there was something more. It's okay, Frank. I just wanted to offer my condolences. If there's anything you need, you let me know, all right? He looked at the floor again and nodded without saying anything. Okay, I'll see you later, Frankie. I said as I turned to leave. John, he said, lifting his head. Yeah? He tipped the can and drained the rest of the beer before tossing the can at the refrigerator. He then began to sob. I... I... I need to... I... Oh, God, I... What is it, Frank? I know you loved your dad. It's okay. We're all going to miss him. It's not that. It... Fuck! He swung his fist and put a hole in the sheetrock next to the refrigerator. I ducked instinctively, although I was not within reach of him. I stepped backward slightly. He staggered a bit, then caught his balance and swayed. I... Son of a... I turned to see S.L. pass by in his Lexus. He cruised slowly, looking straight ahead, and turned at the end of the street. Him, spat Frankie, swaying. I looked from Frankie to where the car had passed and back again. He hit you up for an interview or something? I asked. S.L. Cypress was known for being a bit brash and unsympathetic. He's definitely the kind of guy who would call a man on the day his father died and ask if he had any comments for the late edition. No. Look, I... I have to talk to someone, but it can't be in your fucking paper, okay, John? I need to talk to a friend, and since none of them are around, I need to talk to you. Ignoring the insult, I said, We're friends, Frankie. You can tell me anything. Totally off the record. Off the record, I promise. He helped himself to another beer, then ushered me into the house. He took a look back over his shoulder, scanning the street for something, then closed the garage door and came inside as well. It was... it was them, John. Cypress and my dad. Who was them? I don't know what you mean. Sowen. The murders. It wasn't that guy, uh, uh, Brooks. It was... 
He looked at the floor, glassy eyes haunted, sad. Slow down, Frank. You're not making any sense. They... my dad... Last night, right before, he, he said he needed to confess something. We're not Catholic, but I offered to call a priest or a minister or something. He said it was too late for that, but he couldn't go without telling someone. He stared at the floor in silence, thinking. His eyes went wide, then narrowed. He started and stopped several times before continuing. My dad... Everyone's favorite guy, Mr. Law and Order. Turns out he was a... a... fuck. He liked men and boys, okay? He was a closet freak. He'd go into town and... I don't know... do whatever he did. Hire kids to... to do things. Sam Cypress is his... partner... Cyprus ran into Dad someplace in the city. Long time, years ago. Dad didn't know why Cyprus was there, but he'd been caught cruising by the newspaper man. Dad begged Cyprus not to tell anyone. He had a family and a career, and he'd lose it all if people found out. Cyprus and my father, they made a deal. Sam wouldn't say anything about Dad's dalliances. He'd keep it a secret for him, if he'd do a favor in return. See, see, Sam liked kids too, but he didn't just screw him, he, he killed him. He did worse things than kill him, and my dad was investigating the, uh, disappearances. Sam promised my dad his secret was safe as long as he stopped looking for the missing kids, so he did. But Brooks confessed, I said, walked right into the police station and... My dad killed Charles Brooks, John. He choked him out in his cell. Brooks never confessed to anything. Dad just found an easy mark to take the fall. A bit of work with the documents and he had an open and shut case, except they never found the bodies. Cyprus stopped snatching local children. Dad never knew if he just quit or went other places, but no more kids went missing. Brooks hung for it, and life went on. My heart was beating hard in my chest. This was the story of the century. Local police complicit with a child killer? Off the record or not, the world had to know. I think Sam's going to try to kill me, Frankie said. He's driven by the house a few times today, but every time someone's been here. Look, Frank, I know this whole thing is hard to deal with, but if this is true, we need to tell people. We need to bring Sam to justice. No more secrets. John, you promised. I can't... I can't let people know what kind of a monster my father was. What he did? What he... What he didn't do? My family would be ruined. Frank, think of all the families that were ruined because of him. You can't let him get away with this. Frank stared at the floor and sobbed. It was a long time before he finally nodded. Okay, go. Now, before I change my mind. Good old Opie. I knew he couldn't just let this slide. His father may have been a pederast, but at least he raised his son right. I took some more notes and then made my way outside and back out to my car. I looked up and down the street, but there was no sign of Sam. Sam Hain, I thought. The bastard named himself. I drove home to work on my story in private. Tomorrow, Halloween... I would bring down the sowing killer. I got home just as my wife Janice was packing our daughter into the car. You're home early, she said as she clicked Michelle into her car seat. I walked over and gave her a peck on the cheek and then reached in and tousled the kid's hair. Daddy, she giggled as she reached for me. 
Well, Sheriff Waller passed away, and I've got a couple other assignments. With you guys at Nana and Papa's, the house will be quiet, and I might finish my stories before the deadlines. She came around and gave me a hug and a kiss. Don't get too used to the empty house. We'll be home in the morning and we're going to want a lot of attention from Daddy when we do, okay? I kissed her back and smiled. I'll get as much done as I can tonight so we can play tomorrow, I promise. Janice got into the car and both waved as they pulled out of the driveway. Good. This would go a lot better without a toddler at my heels. Too much was at stake. I wrote my story with Frankie Waller's confession as close to verbatim as I could get. I also wrote the story I had intended to write to turn into SL when I got in. I needed to be quick and clever to switch the stories at the last second. I had just gotten back to the office when SL met me at the door and asked me to come into his office. Adrenaline pumping, I walked with him and he closed the door behind us. Did he know? What did he know? I think I saw you talking to Frank Waller at his home yesterday, yeah? What'd you talk about? Uh, nothing. I stopped by to give condolences for his father passing. He was already drunk, taking it pretty hard. Uh huh, he said, eyes narrowing. That all? He didn't tell you anything else? What would he tell me? He was just sad and drunk. Why? You haven't read this morning's edition yet, have you? He pulled the folded paper from his pocket and handed it to me. There, on the cover, was Frankie's old car, on fire in a field. What is this? Police found our friend Frankie with half of his head missing. Drove his car all the way out to Mill Creek Road, then boom, 12 gauge. I stared at Cyprus, choosing my next words very carefully. I don't know what to say. He was really broken up about his dad, but I didn't think he'd do anything like this. You never do, son. You never do. But you know what else? What's that? There was a box with five pairs of hands and five Halloween masks in the trunk of that old junker. They found... Seems as if old Sheriff Waller did some confessing to our friend Frank before he passed on. Told him something the boy just couldn't handle. The way his eyes bored into me, he knew that I knew about him. Or at least he knew that Frank had told me something. I tried to meet his gaze, but it was impossible. All I could do was stammer, Confess to what? Hands? Whose hands? Sam smiled and sat on the edge of his desk. Well, the hands of the children, of course. Victims of our favorite local legend, Sam Hain. I didn't know what to do or what to say. Here was a man who had killed children for fun, who had successfully blackmailed a town sheriff for decades and had probably just killed Frankie Waller. Well, I'll be damned, I said, and here we thought it was Charles Brooks this whole time. What, were they in on it together? Sam narrowed his eyes, caught off guard for a moment. He didn't say anything. I continued. So, given the new development, do you still want the story? He was silent a few seconds longer before his face softened and he answered, no, no, I'll take it from here. You get some rest, John. You look like you've seen a ghost. My phone began to ring. It was Janice. I pressed the call you back later button and put it back into my pocket. I was up late working on the story. You know, you said you wanted it on your desk by now. And I'm sure it was great, just like everything you write. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to call New York. They'll surely want to hear about Sam Hain this time. Why don't you go on home, John? You really need some rest. My phone began to ring again. Janice. She wouldn't be calling back like this unless it was important. 
I silenced the ringer and held the phone in my hand, letting it vibrate as I backed slowly out of Sam's office. In fact, take a couple of days off. Things are going to be quite busy around here pretty soon, and I want you rested and ready to jump right into the middle of it all. Spend some time with your family, he said. Take that lovely daughter of yours, uh, forgive me. Michelle. Yes, Michelle, my apologies. Take her out trick-or-treating. She's just so excited, isn't she? Bet she can't wait to put on her cute little blue fairy costume. Hell, just take the whole weekend. Something other than the whole conversation was terribly wrong. How would he know what color my kid's dress was? I didn't have time to finish the thought before my phone began to ring for the third time. Then all the pieces fell into place. I pushed the answer button and said, Hold on, Jan, one second. Then to Sam... You said the box had five pairs of hands? Sam nodded. I did. Samhain only had four victims. Whose are the fifth pair? He smiled broadly. I can't even begin to suspect. So horrible. But I don't think it'll be long before we find out. Anyway, that's all for now. Happy Halloween, John. You've just heard Samhain by William Stewart. William Stewart lives in Houston with his wife, kids, and a grumpy old dog. When he's not writing scary stories, you can find him taking naps on the couch, collecting vintage Halloween stuff, and hanging out in the garage trying to make dead things come back to life. And on that note, listeners, we close out this Halloween season at Horror Hill. On behalf of myself and the entire Chilling Tales for Dark Nights team, we hope you have a thrilling, chilling, and perhaps debaucherous holiday this year. And to stave off my own post-Halloween slump, I'll be back next week at the same day and time with more horrifying tales to make your blood run cold. Until then, listeners, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by Eric Peabody and Craig Groshek. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend becoming a patron? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights cabal. That means all of Otis Jiry's scary stories told in the dark, Drew Blood's dark tales, Paul J. McSorley's fear from the heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me personally, I'm on most social media as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. 
the darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark No.